Greetings, I'm Keith Klein, the host of the Venture Fizz podcast, where I interview the most fascinating people in the tech scene. This is episode 320, and today's guest is Mike Duda, managing partner at Bullish. Peloton, Harry's, Warby Parker, Casper, Birchbox, these are all iconic direct-to-consumer brands that have all disrupted various categories that were ripe for disruption. Take Warby Parker, the eyewear company that disrupted Lexotica's business, which pretty much owned the whole market from eyewear brands to storefronts. Or Casper, the company that made the process of purchasing a mattress much more enjoyable. A common thread for all these companies is Bullish. One part consumer investment firm, one part strategic agency, Bullish blends capital consulting and creation to design the most remarkable businesses in the world. In this episode of our podcast, we cover lots of great topics, like a discussion on the state of the state of the consumer market and a deep dive into Function of Beauty, a personalized shampoo direct to consumer company, Mike's background story and his initial career through the ranks in the agency world, a sincere nod of appreciation to first round capital capital for starting office hours for startups and how they were helpful to both of us starting our own businesses, the story of Bullish and how they set out to build a different firm through its project-based work and investments, what it's like building a Super Bowl commercial for a brand, the investment criteria for Bullish and what he means by a chip on the shoulder entrepreneur and so much more. Okay, quick side note. Did you know that you can now watch our podcast interviews on YouTube? Head over to youtube.com slash VentureFizz to access our channel. And from there, you'll find a library of content, including a podcast playlist. While you are there, make sure you click on that subscribe button. All right, without further ado, here is my interview with Mike. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Keith, great to be here. Let's talk some consumer. Woo! Oh, man, we have a lot to talk about because you have invested in pretty much I mean, these brands that are iconic now that have uh, done so many great things in terms of that next generation consumer experience, which I don't want to get into now because uh, we're going to talk about it in a few minutes. But each brand, you're like, if you were like a Monday morning quarterback, you're like, oh, that was so obvious. But at the time for these founders, it wasn't so obvious. Um, but along those lines, I did want to talk about the market today for consumers, like like direct to consumer brands. And you know, there's been a lot of changes since uh, the pandemic and um, you know, there's just been a lot with, uh, you know, 2023 and, you know, recessions. And so, so what's the current state of the state in the consumer industry from your lens, which is obviously a, a great one to be, uh, speaking about. Sure. I'll give, I'll give you probably two different answers on that because the state of consumer is, I think everyone in business should be writing thank you notes to the consumer sector since consumers kept spending when we thought we were headed towards a recession or a major mm -hmm. downturn. And guess what? us we're irrational we kept spending um yep. you know the money that we saved during the pandemic is probably going down in that side so and it's a uh, 68 percent of the u.s gdp so 68 percent of the u.s economy po is powered by consumer discretionary and yet so it's it's almost so big no one sees it uh yeah. so consumer is doing well i think 2024 is going to be a little bit tougher time for growth but there's opportunities now through the vc lens consumer is this awful laughable nasty how could you possibly do it? I know I get this on Twitter. I get this from like very smart, accomplished venture capitalists. Like, oh, why would you invest in consumer? Pah, tech, tech, tech. And, you know, DTC, I think investing last year was down 97% on that side of it. And, and not that consumer DTC is the same thing, but overall. And so, listen, if so one hand, consumer is great. It's big. You don't necessarily have to play the VC game to do very, very well in it. And yet... Um, Whereas maybe a number of months ago, I'd have bile and get off my lawn scornness for those who think otherwise. The more people who don't think there's an opportunity, the better, because this is what we do. And there's some darn good entrepreneurs out there that are going to prove us, prove us right, like uh, some of the ones in the past. So true. So true. I mean, one of the brands that you're an investor in is Function of Beauty, which uh, my wife, my two daughters, there's a lot of Function of Beauty in, in my house. So God bless the Klein family. Thank you so much. And on there, it's a, it's a great proposition. And it just, it's like every startup's got their, their, their story. You have, a, you have literally a doctor from MIT and then two other people, including a former like naval submarine commander who, uh, God damn it, just had to disrupt shampoo. <laughs> and it just is such a great product that you can customize. You know, when people say like, well, can this beat Amazon or can this beat that? It's, People want customization. They want personalization. They want stuff in a way that they want to, and that's not gonna that's not gonna change anytime soon. And um, 
they've worked really hard. I mean, they were pre-pandemic, like into the nine figures in revenue, and certainly Al Catterton made a big put on them. So uh, now they certainly have the personalization and custom business, and you can also get them at Target. So um, they're fulfilling the proposition um, because like a lot of founders, they obsess over the people giving them money and they worry about what if she doesn't, what if we do something wrong? And that's uh, far more important than anything we can teach in marketing, brand, or CAC is, is that kind of attitude. And, and that team has it. Yeah, no, it's definitely a great brand. And uh, yeah, like he talked about the background of the founders. How are they uniquely qualified, right, to start a company doing what they're doing, which was a very unique business. And I just know from the lens of my family, everyone's hair is different. So that personalization really hits that consumer cord with them. It's like, wow, this is has my name on the bottle even, right? So the packaging. So Yeah, so do so I'm curious, what do your daughters, do they put their names on it? It was a function of goddess or function of confidence. It's amazing some of the things written on there. Mine says function of Duda, but I'm like a little bit different than the typical consumer. I'm curious, what what do they do? They put their names, your daughters put their yeah, names on it's it? Yeah, they put yeah. their first name on it. Yeah, yeah. So And that's tremendous on that. And yet- they embody what we look for in a lot of entrepreneurs is one, a passionate and persistent burn the boat mentality to solve the problem and make something better. And two, naivete. You, you don't see these categories being disrupted by 20 year Procter and Gamble veterans or anything like that. It's as you grow no. And so, you know, one of our first investors is the founder of Under Armour, Kevin Plank. And he said Under Armour succeeded because he was naive enough to not know what he couldn't accomplish. And so that's the thing. We take talented people that are helping in solving a problem for a bear, for a consumer, a customer, and um, then they start minority reporting what can go wrong or what can go right on that side of it. And it's as easy and as hard as that um, uh, at the end of the day. All right. So let's rewind the clock. So where did you grow up? What were you like as a child? I'm a pain in the ass from Syracuse, New York, the best city on earth. Um, mm -hmm. I never knew what venture was or marketing, branding, like Syracuse. God's honest, I think it is one of the best places on earth because it's real. There's a blue collar mentality and that people do what they say they're going to do. It's uh, uh, just good salt of the earth people, also known as the salt city. So um, my dad was a, a lawyer for uh, Onondaga County and my, my mom was a stay-at-home mom and then she became part-time uh, to kind of help out. And so uh, uh, it was it was great. And yes, I, I romanticize and still make everything go back to uh, the good old days of Syracuse, New York. Um, in fact, just to show you how much I'm a psychopath of that, uh, I was just listening the other day to episode 315. And I'm like, gosh darn it, I wish I'd done this earlier because 315 is the area code to Syracuse. I'm like, how cool could it have been if I was episode 315? <laughs> that's so awesome. Keith, that's that's what you're dealing with. <laughs> that's well, new football coach at Syracuse. So bright days ahead, right? Uh, from your lips to God's ears, but yeah, we're pulling in talent that we haven't seen in a good 20, 25 years. So um, um, very, very bullish on Fran Brown. All right. So how did you get your career started? Um, in fifth grade, St. Anne's School in Syracuse, New York, you had to do a, a story like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I don't remember how I got there. Um, later, I found out I had attention deficit disorder when I was 24. So of course, like two days before, I'm like, I think I want to be a broadcaster. Because the people on TV shape how we who we want to vote for for president and what things we want to buy. So for some reason, when I was like eight, I want to be a broadcaster. And so I kind of followed that throughout and morphed that a little bit to be more, all right, um, I'm not the worst looking guy in the world, but maybe I'm not the guy to be a broadcaster. And I have this weird dialect thing where I speak too fast. So maybe not broadcasting, but you know, PR people shape the way we think and do. So maybe I want to do that. And so it was always something in the realm of brand and marketing and communications and uh, started my career in Rochester, New York at a rest in peace agency called Hutchins, Young and Rubicam, where I got to go around the country and talk about exciting stories about Xerox copiers and the customers behind them. Um, the Docutech 135, by the way, what a great piece of equipment that was. So I'd be flying to Jacksonville and to Louisville and to Calgary to tell these great stories from quick printers on that side. And so um and that served me well for 15 or 20 years. So uh, yes, yeah, that's right. Well, before I got into the investing world, this is the only investing job I've ever had, but um, I, I was a brand marketing person by by default ever since I was in fifth grade. So thank you, Sister uh, Mary Aileen, uh, who I believe was a fifth grade teacher at the time that forced that. So I, I, I went back to St. Anne's. Well, you had a, um, 
a nice rung in one of the one of the firms where you were the the youngest partner in in company history. So like what like what were you working on during that stretch of time? Because I'm I'm envisioning you know these you, know, you talk about Xerox, but like you know these other iconic brands and things that they were trying to uh, advertise or promote. Yeah, that's the fun. I, I think people that go in the agency world are some of the most talented, impactful people there are because in in the advertising agency or public relations, whatever you're trying to solve problems and do it in a way that is creative or unique. So it combines some great people in consumer insight and strategy with creative people like, how can we like wonderfully intercept you in a right moment or get you thinking about things in a different way? And for 13 years, I was blessed to do that at an agency called Deutsch, um, where I was from like, God, 97 to 2010. I made so many mistakes. They gave me so much room to hang myself and I, I somehow didn't. And, uh, I believed in that place, I believed in the people. I, I've still never seen as strong of a culture like it, uh, maybe than other uh, Under Armour on a, on a mass scale. And uh, the fun is we get to solve problems across categories. So you might be one in one meeting, figure out like, how are we gonna launch Ikea in the United States? To the next meeting is like, how are we gonna turn around this car brand that's been declining market share for six years? And you get to learn to be smart in a lot of different categories, but stay naive. And, and that's something that I've brought forward to today is like, the know-it-alls who think they have all the answers, they're not the ones that are going to pick the next venture stars tomorrow. It's those who um, who have the ability to gain from experience, but also stay naive or forget. Just because something failed in 2008 doesn't mean the next one's going to fail in 2024. So um, that's the kind of stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, the, 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 the agency world have a, have a love affection for. So you started your own agency at some point. So, so talk about the details of uh, how that all came together. So around the time of the financial crisis, which maybe some of the listeners are too young to remember, but I'm going to go with it anyway. 2008, when the world seemingly was coming to end with mortgage crises and everything, um, I had this yearning because we were very successful in what we did in the agency world. And we were very highly regarded, awarded, a lot of reverence, except by this group of people called Wall Street. You know, Wall Street was coming out of like the dot bomb period and suffering and, and CFOs kind of became the new rock stars in, in the corporate world. And one of the things that was definitely going on is marketing was being cut back and, and marketing was being cut first and restored last. And that kind of set me off a little bit because I think we can add such tremendous value in terms of what brand and marketing people can do. Where were they're kind of right though is if you're on Wall Street, you're only as good as your last deal and you're, it's performance-based. Whereas in the marketing world, just like the law firm world, you get paid for the time it takes to create outputs but not necessarily correlation to the outcome of like, you know, how good that was. So I was like, what happens if we took a few people that are good at what we do and combine it with some of those principles that it's, we're only as good as like, you know, the impact of what we did. And so back in, then I wanted to invest in this little company called Betaworks. And Betaworks was an unknown entity and all that stuff. John Borthwick and at the time, Eddie Weissman, now Union Square Ventures. And I thought they were brilliant. And I wanted to put a half million dollars into them and just like see that out. and had we done that, that would have, that would have done extremely well. Um, but finally, I remember they September 29, 2008, and the market fell because of some bill that wasn't passed. And I walked into Donnie Deutsch's office and just said, I, uh, I resign. I have to do this thing. And I, I was looking for an excuse to do it. I kind of knew there was going to be some bad times coming, whatever. And like, Hey, if this is a way of getting out, so maybe other people wouldn't lose their job. So be it. But, uh, Long story short, uh, I was supposed to say six months. I wound up staying two years. Had a very good relationship with them. Met my wife at Deutsch uh, on that side, and and wanted to put together a mousetrap where you take, like I said earlier, some pretty, either really talented or really cocksure or really naive people, and blend that into like let's put skin in the game. And uh, that's how Consigliere Brand Capital was born, and and we we finally launched in 2010. Um, and thanks to a lot of help of like first round capital who almost babysat me for like two years during that process. But uh, you know, now some a few years later, uh, despite all the mistakes I've made, the premise works because it makes sense. And when you have damn good people um, fighting on behalf of it, it's it's amazing what can happen. Well, the, the the first round capital piece, I did want to talk about that because as I was doing my research, preparing for this interview, in another podcast, you talked about first round capital and they held these office hours. And I was just like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, I attended the same office hours in New York and Philly because I had just moved from Boston to Philly. And uh, I was just trying to build my network here. And 
I went to the office hours in Philly and, and met Josh Koppelman and it literally was game changing for my career. <laughs> like, oh, we're, we can geek out uh, for those podcasts and this, but uh, so this is back in like right when Twitter now X Twitter was just launching and I got to follow some people on it, including Kent Goldman and Chris Freilich, who were at first run capital and they're promoting this idea of office hours. And I I'd been like hatching um, this idea for, for, for what bullish is today. And so they're doing a live hours at live bait, this total dive bar at 23rd Madison, New York city. And so I show up there looking like the dork that I am. And it's like, there are people there that are like Google engineers that like, we're talking about these tech things. And I'm like, what is going on? Where, where, what am I doing here? Oh my God. And I just remember you get 10 minutes for office hours, you get to pitch an idea and you get feedback. And I they had a number of their partners there and I happened to be blessed enough to get Josh Koppelman. And I was going through this. I had my little pitch deck there in front of me. What do you think? And at the, at the end, he basically said, he gave me his card. He's like, you have something here. Let me know if I could be useful. And literally I walked out, I called my wife and it was like a dumb and dumber moment. Like he's saying I got a chance. <laughs> and that 10 minutes, um, I kid you not, it was probably the most impactful 10 minutes to, to truly doing this. And um, what was also interesting that, that at that particular office hours is there was a Spencer Ante was doing a cover story for Business Week on First Run Capital. And this is 2009 when like, early stage venture wasn't really like a mass thing. Like there was no shark tank. There was this stuff. Like it was like kind of hidden behind and, and they were doing a story. And next thing you know, that story comes out a month later and first round capital is blowing up. Like it's, it became nationally known in business and entrepreneurship. And I was just so inspired and in, in tooling it. First round was also having their next office hours in San Francisco. And that's kind of where the other home base was besides Philadelphia and I wanted to kind of show like, okay, I took some of those learnings and I'm applying it. And I want more feedback. And so I signed up for it and I literally got DMs on Twitter back. Like, Mike, we'll be back in New York. It's okay. I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm not done. I'm, I'm going forward with this. So I took a day off work, um, went to the back of the bus of the plane at 6 a.m. You know, I was probably sat in the middle seat, got there and uh, hung out in San Francisco a little bit and walked in this office. It was awesome. It was walking into like this kind of like circus of broken toys. And I put myself in there <laughs> and that you had people like, I remember these two older gentlemen with three piece suits with a rock'em sock'em robot, I think with them and just seeing all that. And um, it was awesome because that was a form of capitalism. There was so much hope in there that people were pitching these emerging venture capitalists that are like Midas touch makers, right? And uh I remember just sitting there. It was just great. And and there were 78 companies. I found this out later. There were 78 companies that uh, that were there. Uh, 74 of them got the 10 minutes. Three of them got 30 minutes. And one got an hour and a half. I was fortunate to be the one that got an hour and a half. And with Kent Goldman and Christine Heron at the time and and Chris Freilich. And they were like sitting down and, and, and doing it with me. And then, you know, I remember Christine said, are you really going to do this? Or are you one of those entrepreneurs? And I'm like, ooh. Uh, something I appreciate later. And it was just one of those things that just, um, it made me better and to see it. And I, I just, I can't tell you as silly as that story sounds, um, I can recall much more vividly and more impactful than any course I might've taken in college or high school for that matter. So um, the first round capital spirit, which was so pivotal, I think at that time and, and still pervades in a different way um, now is that such impact. And I, and I can't thank, I can't thank the first run capital team enough. Yeah, Sam, it was so uh, unique at the time because there was no platform teams, there was no office hours, and those ten minutes, you know, afterwards, Josh introduced me to Haley Barner, the co-founder of Birchbox, that was my first foray into the New York tech ecosystem, where I helped them when they were like, I don't know, maybe twenty people with four of their key hires and. Uh, you know, it was amazing to work with Haley. And uh, so anyways, hats off well, to the the groundbreaking team there at, at first round. Similarly, so it's like Finn Barnes brought us into a company called Birchbox. So Birchbox was our very first investment. And so right. we were blessed to, to back uh, Katya and Haley. And, and now Haley, of course, is a, a partner at First Round Capital today. And, you know, they had a hard time tra raising money. It's quite true. It's like if you and I walk in a pitch room, it's like it's probably easier to get it than like, to women, especially doing cosmetics, because dudes in Palo Alto and Silicon Valley don't get makeup and uh, the consumer habits, even though women are 83% of the consumer purchase and decision cycle. And 
and Burge Fox hit it and crushed it. I mean, they were great. And so that that was a big way to put us on the map. So uh, another reason we have Birch Box in common to how first round kind of brought us in. So uh, maybe we were separated at birth, Keith. I, I, yeah, it's possible. Back. It's possible. Yeah. It's, all yeah. right. So eventually the, the firm became bullish, Yeah. Um, which again, like I think is, you know, one part agency, but one part investment firm. But So that is unique. I mean, it's still unique today. It's not like there's, you know, there's the platform with the investors, then there's agencies, but there's not really many blends of the two. Yeah, and I'm glad you picked that out. It's it's not a platform. It's our it's our ethos and and that. And that's when we were consigliere brand capital, consigliere trusted advisor is a little bit different out there. And that, and we took marketing and practitioners' principles from uh, using consumer insight and studying demand behavior to pick to pick out some of the the bets that we made uh, on that. But we weren't fulfilling the, the the proposition of actually strategy is great, insight is great. But after the investment, how do you help some of these entrepreneurs with like what the website looks like, or what marketing budgeting should be, or what a you know maybe maybe what an ad campaign looks like at a certain point in time? And so I kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater, um, and that's when Brent came in full time and kind of just shed that we weren't just an advisor; we were actually a doer. And, and stating like money was the least valuable thing we brought, but it was certainly valuable. I mean, cash is such oxygen to it, the the pre-seed and uh, stage of a company. And so um, company was named rebranded bullish after we bought 30 or 40 different names in GoDaddy and uh, uh, all that. My my wife, of course, came up with the name. So we're in the business, but it's like my, my wife mentioned the name when I was in a phone call with Brent at one point at like 930 at night, like, ooh, that's good. Um, and bullish is like, it's a positive outlook. It's yes. If it's, it's got a wall street connotation. So it's, uh, we want to do something a little bit different than, than all the, uh, TCBs. I'm not picking on firms like all the, the three letters or in wall street, Blackstone, black rock, rock corner, center rock. Like we aren't named after a river, a mountain, a 16th century, like night that with folklore from like Romania, <laughs> it just, it's a proposition and almost a benefit statement. So, um, Hopefully, one of the many ways we stand out. All right, and you already highlighted this, but it, you know, it's another unique part of it is on the agency is is the pay for performance model, which is unique too, where you're achieving value for your customers and obviously benefiting from it in terms of the, you know, how your firm earns money. Yeah, we do a lot of work for our portfolio companies. Um, either that's like cost of entry to get into a deal, or like later stage when they have budget for it. But we're also open for hire. So we've done three Super Bowl campaigns in the past six years. We've done stuff with the likes of Walmart and TaylorMade. Um, we've worked with private equity firms to install direct-to-consumer like business models inside legacy companies. So it's all to say it's like, hey, don't just we're not just like offering this marketing like it's a oh, like a relative on the couch you have to use. It's like no, we're pretty good at this stuff. Um, and what's great about it, we we attract talent because they want to work with founders to to get involved at the earliest stages of, of what a brand could be. Um, you know, if you go back to, if, if you look at on the job applicant, kind of like a steam list, I think advertising people are right up there with politicians and used car salesmen. And the reason why is you make me buy stuff I don't want. It's like, well, <laughs> when you get hired by a big, a big company to say like sell a car that isn't good, it's a lot cheaper to do a marketing campaign to, I'll say, find the good on the car than change the car. And so that's why. Um, but we can bring those same abilities into something that doesn't have scale. It's actually great because you can dream up things that are a better customer experience or smarter uh, go-to-market strategy or better website experience than the incumbents. So the lack of muscle memory is such an opportunity to bring creators and strategists and designers into the earliest stages um, to be a, not necessarily a co-pilot to the entrepreneur, but be in the in the foxhole. Because um, ultimately, you know, I, I say this, we're, we're the nanny, we're not the mother. I mean, the founder is the chief brand officer. Our job is to be supportive um, and we're not founder friendly. Supportive means calling people on their crap when they're not doing it right. Hey, hey, you're losing the proposition. Like why is customer service so bad? Why are we doing it? We we made note to the consumer uh, on that. And so to do that, we have to be vested in understanding the business, but naive to internal politics. So that's that's what our role is within companies. And it's just, it is so much fun to be in meetings where you see someone uh, on the far left brain side of things is like a, an analyst on our team might be on paper to the, you know, the creative with the neck tattoo and, and the beard and everything trying to figure out how to solve the problem. When you, when you bring diverse talent around the table, to solve problems, it is amazing what can happen. All right. Three Super Bowl commercials. I'm sure we could do our own 
podcast on just this alone. But so that's uh, in itself, like the, you know, the, the, that's the go time of all ads, right? Like that's your multi-million dollar, 30 minute ad spot that is going to get scrutinized that, you know, these hundreds of millions of consumers are actually watching. Um, what's that process like building a, a Super Bowl commercial for a brand? It is awesome to say, yes, we're going to do it. And then to go through it because you're developing it usually over the holiday time. And there's so much pressure on it, like what you said, but you know, the Super Bowl is, you know, in time, like think of all the distractions we have in a day. And now it's just like, if you were, you know, TV stations have to compete against TikTok and Xbox and all these things. So the Super Bowl is one of the few times where America gathers around the TV or video device and, and watches. So what a great opportunity for brands to like put a stake in the ground and, and break through and not only break through by like, haha, being funny and get noticed, but an opportunity to like drive sales. We think the Super Bowl can be one of the best direct response mediums out there, period. Um, you know, one we did for GoDaddy, like wound up getting over like 1.3 billion impressions. I'm not the biggest impression guy, but when they, like the three days after the Super Bowl spot ran, they actually did an investor relations release saying it was their highest performing 24 hour period in revenue they've ever had. And they'd wow. done nine prior ones. So people think it's like, oh, the Super Bowl is a waste of money. You should spend it on digital and all that stuff. The, I'm going to politely disagree to kingdom come. If you do it well, you can use that as a platform and get far more than the millions of dollars that you put into it in terms of building a business on that side. Yeah, but we do see a lot of bad Super Bowl examples um, of doing it for the sake of doing it. But um, we we're pro Super Bowl. That said, if I don't do it, we don't. We're not part of another Super Bowl commercial. I will live a long, happy life because there's a lot <laughs> of stress that comes with it, and um, and in today's cancel culture and other things too, it's just like it's hard to do something that's arresting and entertaining without offending someone who uses that moment to, to maybe mm -hmm. adopt the cause. So it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's hard, but it, it could be strong ROI better than any, you know, pure CAC number I can, I can think of. I thought it was even better when people actually like, like all the Super Bowl commercials are released before the Super Bowl now. So it's like, not I, like it used to like sit there on pins and needles, like, Oh, what's this brand Doritos going to do this year with her. But, um, all right. So how did you get involved in the investment side? Because again, that's very unique. So it was like, okay, we'll take money earned from our firm or do you have an LP? Like, how do you actually have a fund to invest into consumer brands? Yeah. So our, so our go-to-market offense now is bullish. We're one proposition and we have a, a series of funds. We're just under hundred million AUM. Our latest uh, brand fund two closed in February, 2023. So to invest in B2C, um, opportunities at the pre-seed through series a level that are built in the united states um and then it's like a sister company that doesn't overlap except we all sit together is a you know it's an s corp it's a marketing firm that does great brand strategy design and communications and that's work for hire and so we will ultimately go into business and do things and we'll say like we'll put money on the line here so maybe instead of getting a million dollars of a fee for something we'll take a little bit off the table and put it into a bonus pool by the senior executives where we can. We have a number of occasions where people like the fact that you're willing to do that, we'll just pay your fee and to get your word because you are an investor on that side of it. So our, our goal is to do pay for performance. Not everyone wants it that way. But on the investing side, um, you know, there's been cases where we've invested a million dollars plus, and then we were running point on rebranding a company. And so we're putting our reputations on the line and where that chief brand officer relies on us to rename and rebrand a company that could change the trajectory of the company, like good or bad. So ultimately at the day, we have a report card. And on the investing side, it's it's uh, pretty obvious based on where returns are. And then on, on the uh, the marketing agency side, it's just like if we have repeat customers. It generally means it's because we're doing pretty good work that's it's hitting the needle. So, um, and that's going to be more needed more than ever uh, as we head into the next year. Well, we talked about how you made the connection to Birchbox, but I mean, there's amazing brands here. I mean, uh, Peloton, from what I gathered, 13 months before the bike was even released, you were involved. Harry's, Warb Warby Parker, Bubble Beauty, Casper. I mean, there's more, but I mean, those are ones that definitely people will recognize. So how do you how did you meet these founders at such an early stage? Various stories to that. And I think that's, I, I'm glad you brought that final point. It's the founders. It's the people. It's amazing if we've won any championships, you look around the floor and who we've been on there with. And 
when you meet the Katyas and the Haley's and the Jeff Raiders and Andy's and the shies of bubble who's ripping the ball off the cover, you see a common element there, which is like an insatiable desire to improve something in a consumer's life that's not there, um, a burn the boat mentality that they're going to do it or else, and then an obsession over customer service. Um, and listen, there's other things to it too. Like there's got to be something brand built in, something uniquely brand oriented built into the product, whether that's Peloton was a sexier bike than anything out at the time or Bubble Beauty, which had built a 3000 person community before they launched and just like mind and understood what was going on with like that, that 13 to 22 year old, which is amazing. And that just, you know, element towards it. And so, you know, part early, it's like we got some, you know, we were able to get some press coverage and John Foley and I worked in the same building that was now the Google building. Um, uh, and so he reached out and, uh, on that side. Um, Jeff actually benchmarked us and talked to three of our uh, portfolio companies, including Haley, and walked in to detail what his proposition is a year before launch. And he said, we're taking on Gillette. I've raised all the money I need, but if we don't have a brand, we won't win. And that was just like, I mean, literally goosebumps on that side. And so that was one of the easier go, no go decisions I've ever had privy to out there. So, and then over time, because of the hard work of the Pelotons and the Birch boxes and, and the Harry's and Warby Parker's, it's just like, that, that is a great calling card because we're again, guilt by association. So the bubble beauties find us and say like, cause there's seemingly less people investing in consumer our stage. So it's like, we have a, we have a, we have a track record and, and I will say this to every entrepreneur, um, you're not going to win because of cap table validation. It's when you get consumer vindication. And so while that benefits us, yes, we'll take that. We're very proud and we're, we're, we're equally say, we'll talk about some of the zeros that Yes, we've had some some write-offs in this thing too, but we wouldn't change a thing. And just that's, listen, we're the only asset class that's built to lose money in that way. Um, but when we feel good about like the team is such a big part of it, I think we overcomplicate it. And then we write our investment memos of pre-parade. How does this return the fund and why? And it's probably because it hit product culture fit, not product market fit. And then pre-mortem, how does this fail? Same thing happens reverse. Like, this isn't adopted or people don't change their ways or anything like that. Like we feel pretty good about it because that's, that's what our LPs pay us to do is to find high upside opportunities. And, you know, while ultimately there's going to be some that go to zero, you know, in, in the case of Peloton, we made 22 times our money in three and a half years and you make your money, money times over. And we did get up before the IPO, which yes, we left money on the table, but you know what? It's just, I'm not going to apologize for taking a 22 X. So, <laughs> um, uh, on that side, but it's it. It is so much fun. But again, it, boiling it down to this ability to identify great people and great. I might have a different definition than you, or a SaaS investor, or a crypto wizard, or something like that. But it just it's the people, and I think the way we vet is a little bit different. What we look for is certainly different, given we study the consumer and the demand side uh, of of the U.S. citizen more than anybody else. I don't think there is another venture firm that knows more about how America shops does stuff, how much they're liars and all that. Because when you're working with a Walmart, a TaylorMade, an Anheuser-Busch and Pepsi on the marketing side, you get consumer research about what America looks like. You don't lose that. You don't forget it. Now, we don't tell the world. It's not that, but um, you, you don't lose sight of it. So it's just so much of it isn't just what appears in those magic 10-page slides when we get as investors. It's like, is this real? Would people do this? And um, that's why consumer is wonderfully fun and frustrating at the same time. But that's where I, I drew the the two sides together to show just immense power of knowledge to investment of the scale of what you're seeing versus what very smart associates and senior associates are researching in a VC firm. There's no way that matches the power of what your agency is doing from the overall understanding of consumers. And when I mentioned before, kind of like the Monday morning quarterback, it's like you look at these brands like Peloton. I mean, I... I it's just a great brand. It's a great experience. I love my Peloton. And you get that tribe of people that just love that experience. Harry's, like, I'm going to sound like I'm uh, at a tech crunch, I mean, uh, a tech stars demo, demo day, but buying razors sucks. You have to go to a CVS and they got to unlock the thing. And it's like, how much is this razor? Like the experience is terrible yet. It, you just need a razor, right? So the Harry's, right? Warby Parker, like uh, first round again, they introduced me to, I think Dave Gilboa and I, I didn't know every glass, <laughs> glasses were all owned by Lexotica. I didn't know that market was all owned by this monopoly. 
So they disrupted that. I mean, just, and you can go on and on like Casper. I still think any mattress retailer is like a storefront for something else that they're like, what is going on? Like who's going to these mattress? T- so I think the retail is like a front. So anyways, these are brands in categories that Monday morning quarterback, it's easy to look at that, that needed to be disrupted. Yeah. And, and what's interesting over the course of time is then for Harry's to be successful, what happens? They're sold at CVS. They're sold at Target. Yes. And, everything. and that, that was, uh, I'd actually say of all the DTC 1.0 brands, that was the one that let it out because they went on this 13 month journey to, to be sold at Target. And uh, sorry for all your P&G listeners, but I think the buyer at Target was like, listen, P&G, R- Gillette is like, dominates the aisle. It's like 81% market share. You have to bring something new in. And and the first three months at Target, they sold, they had 25% of the real estate and they were selling 53% of the handles. It's like, aha, that's something new. So while it started as DTC, it was like cut out the middleman and it's like a, a cheaper price and it's fair and everything. The values of Harry, like Gillette, Gillette is like the best a man can get, like 1980s, <laughs> yeah. And Harry's like, the name of the company is called Harry's. So they're like, we got you. So it's just, it's a, it's a different brand choice. Like we yeah. we tend to think, uh, I, I really do think a lot of consumer purchases are irrational. Like why you pick this versus that? Is it because that fits better or is that better? It's how we feel and so emotional. And so Harry's has values that is open. And the other thing is too, we, is reality is not everyone spends all their time on Facebook and Google and gets everything through Amazon subscribe and save. So you have to be where your consumer is. And that's the great thing about a number of our companies, for all the ones you mentioned, that at some point in time, either they 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 went beyond DTC or, or in the case of Warby and for a long time Peloton, just own DTC because Warby has something like 200 stores now, but you can go online. They're going to be, they're going to meet you where you're needed. And the same thing, if I run out of like toothpaste or Q-tips, I'm not going to wait for the start. I'm probably going to go to a CVS or I'm probably going to go to a Whole Foods, right? And so the what DTC allows is it allows you to not only get money from your consumers, but get feedback. It's a great feedback loop. And 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 the companies that really broke out didn't rely on the meta approach of just acquiring customers. They got to know who their customers were, ensure that they were coming back for more. And also, what, what else is, do they have permission for? I mean, Harry's now is like, is in many ways, like throughout their bathroom. Like I literally have 27 products of Harry's or Flamingo in our bathroom. Judge me if you will, but that's true. So it's uh, companies that remain empathetic to who their customers are and grow with them and listen to them tend to win. And so um, that's why it's so great to see the revolution. Bubble Beauty is doing it today. Uh, there's a few more that we're on the verge of becoming famous and, and that side of it. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's hilarious to think it's like the bets we make today We'll find out by 2030 if we are right or not. That just cracks me up, right? So yeah. um, if only I had a crystal ball that worked and wasn't permanently shattered, that'd be another thing. But uh, uh, And again, another reason why we go back to like backing great entrepreneurs that have a little bit of something different than just the proposition that could change six months later. So I digress. Well, part of your due diligence process that you had outlined on another podcast I listened to was chip on the shoulder entrepreneurs. So what do you mean by that? It's something I've alluded to a little bit earlier. It's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a person or a team. Um, and she's insanely like driven to solve a problem um, or make a, something a consumer better. And to take a step back, I never assume, we never assume we're the consumers in this stuff. It's just like the entrepreneurs know far more than we do, but this is where we go through our consumer diligence part. So someone who's hellbent, we need to bring something because this, this category is low NPS scores and all those things. Someone that has a natural built brand advantage built in, and that could be the design a la a Peloton or a Casper, or from the experience, getting a Casper in five days versus waiting 10, 10 weeks. They've over-indexed somewhere, and that could be on customer service, that could be brand, that could be, I guess, price. The rational attributes don't tend to last that long. Um, and then we get into the, it's got to be financially viable, um, not to get into the boring VC stuff, but we like high gross margins. We like repeat rates. Um, we like founders, and we like situations that look in terms of an LTV, not just CAC. I think CAC is the most overrated three-letter acronym in, or metaphor, whatever acronym in, in the sport. Um, if you do it well, you should have several CACs. Your best customers might come in at a hundred buck CAC, but their lifetime value is 1200. Is that better at someone coming in at 20 and being like 82? 
you tell me on that. So I think CAC is is has been a golden calf that's overly worshipped. Um, and so to that, what you just said, the chip on the shoulder entrepreneur, it's someone is like, this has to exist, but equally paranoid is why it could fail or why we could lose her dollar. And those companies tend to over obsess about customer service or doing right when something goes wrong. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen versus, you know, we've seen a lot of companies do mirror, mirror on the wall, enjoy the fame that comes from rising up like a TechCrunch article or New York Times article. But it's just like if you're worshiping the press and things like raising venture capital dollars, that's not the end game. The end game is doing right by the consumer. And like, what happens when you don't? I mean, Warby Parker's infamous for when they um, they did advertising, they got so much demand. Oh my God, they couldn't fulfill orders for three or four months. Good by them to cut advertising, invest in customer service. And that's been part of their DNA ever since. And you would think people would be like, oh my God, how could you, you promise? People are pretty empathetic when you're empathetic back. And so many like business relationships are bad because businesses do things like, Good luck trying to cancel your, you know, subscription to this thing or that thing. It's just like versus others like, no, we totally understand. You can go back. We hope you can or we screwed up. Here's what's going to happen. If you want your money back, we'll refund or not. Like consumers, when they feel they're in it with brands, like tend to give them benefit of the doubt. And, and that's the kind of stuff that goes wrapped up in that chip on the shoulder entrepreneur. So what, what advice do you have for like an up and coming, like an entrepreneur that's trying to build an up and coming brand? Oof. God, I, I wish this is where I was in, in intelligence would take over in terms of advice. I, I'd say perspectives more than advice and perspectives. One, like great propositions, find a way, find a way to make them. In other words, if you don't get clown venture capital to invest and they did the most esteemed brands, that doesn't mean you're going to fail. Two, it's just what success looks like. Don't necessarily re believe all these podcasts. Because, you know, in, you know, you see a lot of podcasts and, and, and there's some great podcasts that almost overly romanticize the entrepreneurial spirit. The shit is hard. Uh, Peloton was chapter seven twice. John Foley willed that through like some weird board dynamics and other things too. But it's it just like he was built for it and, and he deserves a lot of credit. Um, Shy at, at Bubble Beauty, same thing, has gone through like different things and overcame them and like. I wouldn't say pivoted, but evolved the proposition. And it is like literally slaying it right now. Uh, I would hate to compete against Bubble on that side of it. And so there's there's a lot of down, dark moments that people don't talk about because we only come on these smiley faces and all this stuff. This stuff is hard. There's not one right way. Um, the other maybe controversial thing is not everyone has to raise venture. You know, there's 5.1 million businesses launched last year. I think on average about 0.5% will raise venture dollars. Um, and listen, if you're, if you're an overlooked founder, if you're female, if you're black or that it's like, it's tougher to raise it. Like it's cards are stacked against you in many ways. And that's ridiculous. It's unfortunate, but how can you bring this to market and how do you show progression? How do you like, who's your unique customer and how do you get the product and service in their hands and, and things? And the great thing is private investing is becoming cooler and cooler. And as well, there's a lot of VCs that are like poo-pooing consumer or, have gone from 50 million to maybe $800 million funds and maybe about kicked their original strategy. We're seeing more family offices coming into it. We're seeing more people that will be part of it. So um, I don't have the magic wand thing. It's nowhere near as easy if I'm doing it, but like, it's hard. It's like, you have to be realistic. Um, and yet a, one venture investor is not going to define you if, if they say no um, on that side of it. So that that's just some of this matters, but there's so many other dynamics that go into it. Um, or how to, and that's why bringing back to first run capital, we have we started holding office hours uh, the end of last year and through 2023 and more into 2024, and we're doing office hours in cities that aren't huge venture markets. Like we're talking about Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we're talking about Denver, which is bigger. We've done them in Atlanta, which is fascinating. And is coming out, we're going to do it for first time entrepreneurs. What's it like to get out there? So we're trying to do more of that office hours. Uh, concept that first round capital quite frankly did and and, and it goes back to what one of the great lessons i learned um coming out of my brand marketing world we're in that world for you to win everyone else must lose and venture done well generosity is such a big part of the proposition and you know we do 20 minute sessions with people and like you don't have to come and pitch us or whatever how could it be useful and it's amazing how the quality of people we've seen even if they're not consumer it just um, that's why I'm long in America. I'm not running for office, but that's why I'm long in America. And there's not going to be one right way to raise money or do your startup. 
Um, and that's why I didn't say venture startup, but it, this stuff is hard. But if you have something, if you're identifying a gap in the marketplace and you have the ability to bring it to life, like, you know, it, you go for it. But it's uh, it can be done in very non-traditional ways, especially given what the current venture landscape looks like. All right. So we talked about some great brands that you've uh, invested in. How about the ones that maybe you saw like your anti-portfolio like Bessemer has on their website, the ones that you wish you did, but you didn't. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of cases, um, one of the lessons I've learned, I wish if you have conviction, you have conviction or you don't. So in some cases, ooh, we should invest in more money into that. And we didn't, but like, oh, let's take a flyer and put it on there. So I've learned like you either do it or don't. Um, that's one thing. So some of our anti-portfolios, Ooh, we could have gotten a bigger chunk and like I'm talking about two companies that come to mind specifically, um, but don't. Um, the one that's atop the list, without a doubt, Stitch Fix. Mm -hmm. Stitch Fix, like we met Katrina and uh, we had something else in our portfolio that was similar, but was targeting men. And I'm just very conflict oriented. Don't want to do that to, to entrepreneurs. And Katrina was saying, I don't think it's a conflict, but it's like, oh, I think it could be and not. And we elected not to. That company die. It was a, a partners of ours that did that company like died like four months later. Um, and I don't know if you've read any news, but St Stitch Fix went on to be a pretty darn good thing. And oh yeah, and I laugh at that. So like every, I used to do this every year, and I haven't done it in a while. Like every March twenty third, um, or every other at this point, I'll write Katrina a note, um, and it'll say something. I'm stupid, and it's just a reminder <laughs> itself because we come on podcasts like this and like how brilliant we are and all that stuff too. And it's just like, she's clearly great. She had a great concept, um, you know, and I, I think she's moved on, but just it's it's a good reminder um, that uh, we're going to be wrong in this business. That doesn't mean we're rooting in a stitch fix. The stuff that keeps me out at night is the things that we don't see. We didn't see it originally. So you talk about function of beauty. Um, we read about that in like a, a, a Dave Primack. Uh, he wasn't at Axios at the time, like like maybe fortune piece. Fortune but, oh term God. sheet. Yeah, this this is brilliant. And so why didn't we see this? So we we knocked down the door, found someone new him, got in front of him. And, you know, he was a bit cocky coming out of Y Combinator, which tends to be par for the course. Um, and we fought our way in and and he reopened that round for us. And so but I was like, why didn't we see this deal? And so I can I will not lose sleep at night putting money into a company that goes to a zero. Um, our entrepreneurs are working hard. And so it's tougher on them than this. Unless, of course, you know. Bitcoin fraud or something like that, then that that has a whole another podcast episode in there. And luckily we've not witnessed that as some of our sisters and brothers have. Um, but it's, yeah, it's the ones you don't see. And it's like, what can we do more? And, and especially in a world that we talk about the New York ecosystem or the San Francisco ecosystem. I, I'm talking about like the human ecosystem. Like if you're a normal consumer founder, like there's no publication, there's not really a tech crunch for just consumer. Tech crunch is very tech oriented and so how can we find how can we build our brand to be found and how can we be out there through office hours and tapping our founder network um to meet more of these people and it's just uh you know i've joked a lot like growing up espn sports center was like a cultural thing and now it's like the shark tank revolution and pitch competitions are like the new sports center and so and they're t they're happening everywhere which is great for entrepreneurship bad and then i think some entrepreneurs think just you know giving five minutes of good tv or are good enough to get a million dollars, but you know, there's, there's more access to this stuff than ever. And so uh, my job, if I'm going to try and find and sell my money, sell bullish his money to the great entrepreneurs, how do we make sure we're finding all great, all those. And, and it's, it's a tough task, but that's, that's the stuff that I worry about. So our, our anti portfolio is too vast, but I, uh, the ones that we meet, God bless and go well. And uh you know, there's there's others on there like studs, uh, certainly on there. Big fan of that entrepreneur, but like Stitch Fix is, um, without a doubt, at the top of the list. And there'll be more, and that's great. That's just great in general. Again, for us to win doesn't mean we need them to lose at that time as well. So, uh, um, that's what makes this stuff fun, right? So, what's the best way to get on your radar then, if you're a founder that's looking to work with Bullish? We will. So we, I think, last year we looked at. 2,700 deals and we wound up doing seven. So that's not a great hit list, right? But it's, we will look at all cold emails. And here's the thing, make those cold emails not so cold. The amount of emails that we get that are in the 27 that are like, uh, like have nothing to do, that show no empathy or no research to us. 
like if something is outside the US or not consumer, for instance, we've gotten a bunch of those. So show me why. And it's not a suck up thing. Like, oh, I heard your podcast with Keith. You're amazing. That's not it. Show me why this fits our thesis and give me a little teaser or evidence why. Like if there is a any sample evidence that there might be something intriguing, we will take a meeting. And that's that's it. You don't have to win over. Like you don't have to get a guilty verdict. You just have a maybe guilty verdict. And then we'll take the meeting and go for there. So tailor the correspondences to why this has a, a um, could make sense for us. It's something that's US consumer. It's an area that's going to be like that need a disruption. You have a better mousetrap and prove that out in some way, shape or form. The second one is going to be like a almost, you know, VC bingo card. If there's someone in, in our networks that you know, like the shoulder tap, because in the same way in hiring people too, which is, this has gotten to pattern matching, which I'm funny enough, I'm not a fan of pattern matching in many ways. Um, but if I, I get a reach out from Carolyn who says, hey, Mike, could you meet with so-and-so? I think she's great. She wants to meet. We will do that. So through things like LinkedIn and the accessibility of X, don't call me Twitter, you can now do like get, in, get into our mug, so to speak, but do so with a sense of purpose, not, not aha, I gotcha, because I'm in your DMs. So it's, it's stuff like that. It, it's, it's nothing, that's nothing super proprietary that you haven't heard before, but it's the ability to execute against it. Um, I think it's so, so important. All right. Uh, top three apps you can't live without. Uh, does Whoop count as an app? Because it's wearable. Yeah. Yeah, it totally does. Mm -hmm. I'll say I got Whoop. the logo up there. So we'll, we'll, we'll double count that. <laughs> yeah. I want to see like how to get on that wall. Uh, Whoop is one. I'd say ESPN is another one because I love sports on it. Um, and then technically the Gmail app because it's on there. But, you know, I'm I'm going through this cold turkey. I, uh, I, I deleted my TikTok app about eight days ago. And it's weird. Um, I'm not all of a sudden reading the Bible or like War and Peace at this point, too. But it's also amazing. Like, I hope I'm not like I can't live without any of those apps. So that's why I'm going to lead with Whoop on that one. And and certainly I, Pel I still Peloton, big fan uh, on that. But those are... Those are things that, uh, you know, from, from health and mindset, from functional work. And then I love sports. I love sports. So um, uh, as an outlet, but uh, I'd like to think through things like the light phone. I, I can live without all these apps, but uh, yeah, those would be the ones that like I go to the most. How about podcast book recommendation? I mean, Venture Fizz, have you heard about it? It's amazing. <laughs> too kind, it, too kind. It, 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 it's funny. I'm like the worst book reader and uh, out there, but I'd say a book that is resonated with me still is uh, Grit by Amanda Duckworth. Um, so if you go back through this podcast, and you listen to like Chip on the Shore Entrepreneur and the people, like what I loved about that, about Grit in particular, it, it, it measures or tries to quantify the immeasurable and, and get into it. And I think Grit is so much stuff. Like when we do investments, when we do these press releases, we all brag about this financial engineering and TAM and all this other stuff. It's the people. If we're successful, it's because we were smart enough to bet on some really good people that persevered and went through. And I think grit is a great way of one, celebrating it and bring it to the norm. And, and that's why I give <laughs> Professor Duckworth so much credit for doing it because it's probably not the most Wharton-like book versus everything that's like very qualified on that side of it. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of grit in that. Um, podcasts all i know is like on on my phone i have like a a like us deficit look alike in terms of the amount of podcasts that are piling up um i don't i don't have that one seminal thing to add to anyone's library other than of course this one um which i've enjoyed um for a number of months now i know i'm late to the game but uh yeah that's uh to each their own but yeah i, I wish i were more astute but that's the cold dark reality of being mike tuda <laughs> so what about uh outside of work what do you like to do well, there's what i like to do and there's what i do so what i love to do is like go to college football like sports sports is such a great outlet because you can like scream and like you know things you'd be arrested to in real life you can scream and just like passion and it's like therapy and that um i have three boys my wife and i have three boys so uh i tend to go to their sporting events which is great don't scream at them because then you're that guy. And <laughs> I think so. don't want to be that um, guy. <laughs> I, live, I live vicariously through my kids' sports and, and rooting for them. And it's, uh, uh, I, I can't tell you like how proud, like you think, you think you're proud of your kids because of their accomplishments or whatever. I've been sometimes more proud of my kids by things that didn't go well and how they handled it or how 
not devastated they were when they didn't get something to see, like how much they committed to it. So it's things like that. And then I love red wine. I love a good steak. Uh, I love just being a goofball with like a few of my neighbors and friends and everything like that. It's, uh, you know, when, when I answer the question, like when people say, what'd you do this weekend? I'm like, I have the most, it, on paper, sounds the most boring weekends, but like it's cathartic, whatever. It's just uh, um, doing stuff like that. So I haven't climbed any mountains or like quit drinking, lost 35 pounds, do yoga at five in the morning. I'm not that guy. I'm massively flawed, but just, uh, uh, I mean, Syracuse, I hope Syracuse one day just to die that, but like we're going to be better at football, maybe win a basketball cha national championship. At lacrosse will be better um I'm, I'm forever wedded to that and uh and and just being a not so crappy dad well mike thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through your background story obviously all the great work that you and the team at bullish are up to and obviously all the great advice for all those up-and-coming consumer brands that are trying to make it out there yep and if there's anything i left out mike at bullish.co always happy um because if someone's listening to this podcast and got this far they're, they're probably like above average to say the very least in terms of ambition or that chip. So um, we'd we'd love to hear from anybody and food, feedback, good or bad. As I say, I can take any feedback. Just don't talk about my wife and kids and any feedback is good there. So, um, but thank you for the time. This, this is fun. I mean, what we get to do is, is just awesome. So I love talking about it and I appreciate the time.